All right, it is 345 and so we will get started. I want to welcome everyone to this breakout session with our guest speaker, Sharon Yang Song. And let me introduce myself first of all, if you don't know me, I am David Jones, professor of psychology at Westminster. And I will be the moderator for this session. I just want to remind everyone to keep your uh, Zoom on mute for right now. Um, we are going to have about a 20 minute presentation from our speaker, and then we'll do a Q&A at the end. And if you're interested in asking a question, I would ask you to put that in the chat. So let me introduce our guest speaker for today. Sharon Yang Zom is the Director of Programs and External Relations for the Bhutan Foundation, and she is living in Washington, DC. She has a BA in biology from Westminster College and a master's degree in public health from George Washington University, which is located in Washington, DC. Uh, since her graduation, um, Sharing has done all kinds of great work in giving back to her native country in various ways, including working to support health camps for semi-nomadic pastoral communities in rural highland villages in her native country of Bhutan, providing support for individuals with disabilities in Bhutan and helping to develop partnerships with various government agencies in Bhutan with national and international organizations to provide expertise for areas of need in Bhutan. So uh, please join me in welcoming our guest speaker, Sharing Yang Zong. And Sharing, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you, Dr. Jones, um, for the introduction. Um, let me share my screen now. And um, I hope everyone's able to see that. Um, all right. Well, um, thank you for the introduction again, Dr. Jones, and um, thank you to everyone, especially our Westminster students on this call for joining us this afternoon. Um, I'm truly honored to be speaking at today's, uh, at today's uh, Westminster Symposium, and I also want to thank everyone that's worked so hard to put this together, uh, despite the circumstances that we are all in. Um, I actually would have preferred to present this in person, um, but I guess doing virtual will work for now and hope that works for you all too. So to begin with, um, I'd love to hear from all of you, um, perhaps through the chat function, if you've ever been to Bhutan, if you've ever heard of Bhutan, um, and if, if you have been there, kudos to you, and I'd love to hear about your experience. Um, and if you haven't and would love to visit Bhutan sometime, um, please reach out to me and um, I'm, I would be happy to help you arrange your trip for you. So for those who, who don't know where Bhutan is, um, it's located between China and India, and it's about the size of Switzerland. Um, it has a population of about 790,000 people. Um, Missouri, uh, just to give some context, Missouri is actually about 4.7 times bigger than Bhutan. So we are really small. Um, the country has one of the most dramatic landscapes in the world, uh, going from lush tropical jungles in the south at an elevation of about 250 feet, all the way up to snow-covered mountain peaks in the north at over 24,000 feet all within a distance of 80 miles. So that's about 20 miles less than driving from Fulton to St. Louis. Um, so you can see it's an incredibly mountainous country. Um, in this picture, actually, uh, that's Jomalhari Mountain and it's, it's at about 24,065 feet. Um, therefore, to understand Bhutan, you really need to understand its past. So let me start today's presentation by exploring Bhutan's early history, a history that's really allowed it to develop along a much different path than many countries in the world. A path some refer to as the middle path um, and has been articulated by our fourth king as the pursuit of GNH or gross national happiness rather than GDP or GNP or gross national product. 
we will then talk about how this approach has worked for Bhutan and how it's really allowed the country to conserve its rich natural environment and cultural heritage while progressing with its economic and political development. After that, I will end the session with a Q&A uh, for those who are curious to learn more or hear more from me. So we know from archeological records that Neolithic tribes first settled in Bhutan over 4,000 years ago. But Bhutan's modern histi written history uh, really starts in the eighth century um, with the arrival of the most remarkable man, Guru Rinpoche, whose legend says that he came from, uh, to Bhutan from India. He is also popularly known as the second Buddha in Buddhism. It is said that Guru Rinpoche came to Bhutan on the back of a flying tigress and landed at a place considered one of the holiest in South Asia. Taktang, or tiger's nest, is perched on, on the edge of a cliff at about 10,000 feet. Guru Rinpoche brought Buddhism to Bhutan and along with it, its religious and philosophical approach to life that would have a lasting impact upon the people of Bhutan. And Bhutan actually struggled quite a bit internally through decades of civil strife um, until the mid 1850s, when Jigme Namgyal, the father of our first king, ended all civil wars in Bhutan, resulting in the establishment of, the Bhut of Bhutan's monarchy. His son, um, His Majesty Ugin Wangchuk, pictured here, was elected the first monarch of Bhutan in 1907. This was really the beginning of an era of remarkable leadership under the Wangchuk dynasty. So five kings have now served Bhutan, each forging relationships that kept the political balance and allowed Bhutan to evolve as an independent country into the 21st century. Then something remarkable happened. Our fourth king, His Majesty Jigme Singe Wangchuk, announced in 1998 that it was time for Bhutan to become a democracy. And in a matter of 10 years, uh, Bhutan's fifth king, His Majesty Jigme Singe, uh, Kesar Namgyal Wangchu, would become our country's first constitutional monarch. This really was a major step by our kings to give back to the people of Bhutan the power and authority we had vested in our kings a century before, allowing for a peaceful transition to democracy, unprecedented in our time. This transition to democracy did not place, take place without careful planning. In a series of interviews His Majesty had in 1990 for an article in National Geographic magazine, he said that Bhutan was at a crossroads um, and that the country's future was too important to be entrusted in the hands of any one person. He said that in order to transition to democracy, he first had to ensure that Bhutan had an educated middle class in which he could entrust power to lead the country. Fortunately, his father and then the, the then prime minister of the country had started this process in the 1950s, recruiting children from all across Bhutan to go to India to be educated. Later on, Bhutan continued to send, send students for higher education in countries like the US, UK, Thailand, Australia, and many other countries, all the while developing our own education system in the country. Bhutan has now held three national elections, one in 2008, 2013, and the last one was in 2018, in which the people of Bhutan have elected a different government each time. The new bicameral parliament system of governance was set up with the upper house as the national council and the lower house as the national assembly. The national council has about 25 nonpartisan members and then the national assembly um, about 47 members of parliament. Um, I'm, I'm happy to say there's about, uh, about seven members, women uh, members of parliament and um, uh, four women in the national council. So, so with that as a background, I'm now going to discuss about how Bhutan was uh, able to take that middle path to development, uh, one that reflects the country's strong Buddhist values and a g &H approach. Um, we will start by getting a better understanding of what gross national actually means, uh, which you'll see is not so much gaiety and laughter, um, but rather the achievement of contentment in one's life. 
So to begin with, let me remind you of, of this. Um, uh, in 1776, Thomas Jefferson was drafting the US Declaration of Independence which stated that each American had the right to life, liberty, and uh, as originally written, uh, the preservation of property. Um, and Jefferson changed that to the pursuit of happiness. Uh, we like to say that just possibly Bhutan's kings in, are in some ways embodying the reincarnation of Thomas Jefferson, or at least his thoughts. So what we're really saying is happiness is an individual pursuit. Um, and that the government's role is to provide a structure in which um, an individual can find contentment in life. Um, so uh, that structure is based on four pillars, good governance, conservation of the environment, preservation of culture, equitable and sustainable development. Uh, and this type of forward thinking really prepared Bhutan to shift from a complete uh, absolute monarchy to a democratic constitutional monarchy and really prepared the country to enter the modern world. Our fourth king recognized quite early in his reign the merit of a democratic form of government. However, he was asked by a lot of people why this change was needed. Um, after all, Bhutanese lived in relative peace and prosperity uh, when compared to much of Asia or even the world. Um, and the country was really making good progress in terms of development. Um, our king would say, while the Bhutanese people have a good king now, there is no guarantee that future kings would be the same. And so it's better to, uh, for the people of the country themselves to be entrusted with the future governance of the country than any one person. So therefore, it addresses that first pillar uh, of gross national happiness, good governance. And it, it was hard for the Bhutanese people to accept it. Um, but then the day finally came on May 8th, 2008, um, our, our king um, addressed the first constitutional um, constitution of Bhutan um, and uh, to the new democratically uh, elected parliament. And this is what he said. I hereby return to, to our people the powers that have been vested in our kings by our forefathers 100 years ago, members of the first parliament of Bhutan, from this day forth, we place in your hands our unique nation, our greatest treasure in the world. So although Bhutan uh, did establish the structure of a de democracy, the culture of democracy still is considerably new to, uh, to many Bhutanese. So let's take a look at the next pillar. Um, probably no country in the world has done better than Bhutan in conserving our environment. Today, over 70% of the country is under forest cover, and our constitution actually mandates that the country uh, maintain a minimum of 60% forest cover for all times. And Bhutan is the only country in the world to pledge that it will remain car carbon neutral. Um, and in fact, it's actually carbon negative right now, providing a carbon sink for the world and helping to mitigate climate change. Uh, Bhutan has an incredibly rich flora and fauna, including 770 species of birds, uh, almost as many as the U.S., yet Bhutan is about less than 1% of the size of the U.S. Um, this photograph actually is of a wide-bellied heron, and it's considered one of the most endangered birds in the world because there's only about uh, less than 200 of them left. Uh, we have about 50 of them in Bhutan. Um, because of Bhutan's extensive forest coverage, animals such as tigers are found not only in the lowland jungles in the south, but all the way up to 14,000 feet, literally on the edge of glaciers. Bhutan is the only country in the world where tigers and snow leopards share a habitat. And speaking of snow leopards, um, scientists feel that Bhutan is probably one of the best snow leopard habitats remaining in the world especially in this area called Jomohari. And uh, here's a group that we, we um, at the Bhutan Foundation work with. Um, they're a group of local yak herders that we call um, citizen scientists. And they monitor snow leopard populations um, using camera traps. And these people are directly involved with um, valuable research of their own population of snow leopards. And they've actually captured some really exciting imagery such as this one. 
Um, this is a family of snow leopards that are feeding in on one of their yaks. And here's another photograph of a, a snow leopard captured in the mountains up in Jomalari. And these were captured using those camera traps. Um, and now let's talk a little more about climate change. Um, it's a big issue for Bhutan. Um, currently, the government is working really hard to measure the impact of climate change on Bhutan's glaciers, um, a very important issue for a country whose economic future is dependent on the export of hydropower to the South Asia region. Um, as of today, we generate about uh, 1,615 megawatts of hydropower, but in the future, it will double and be a major source of revenue for our economic aspirations. But climate change could severely impact Bhutan. Uh, besides the possible decrease in water from the monsoon and glacial melt, Bhutan has a serious problem with the potential for glacial lake bursts and resulting floods, um, also known as gloffs. Um, due to the melting of the glaciers, there are these lakes that are formed um, behind unstable moraine bit barriers, and there are about 20 of these lakes um, high up in the mountains. Um, and if oh, one of these lakes break, um, you essentially have an online tsunami. Yeah. There's somebody with their oh, mic on. Okay. All right. Um, Sorry about that. Um, so uh, what I was saying was there are these about 20 of these lakes up in um, the mountains in Bhutan. And if one of these were to break, um, essentially there would be an on-land tsunami, like a water wall of about 20 feet high descending down through the lower populated valleys of Bhutan. And actually such an incident took place in 1994 uh, that killed about 21 people and swept away livestock, farms, homes, and also seriously damaged an old heritage site. So moving on, um, uh, the third pillar, uh, we again find an area where we've done quite well in terms of preserving our uh, cultural heritage. Um, looking at the ancient zongs and hakangs or temples, the castle-like structures that dominate Bhutan's landscape. Uh, the intricate weavings and textiles, cultural festivals and ceremonies, we can see the people of Bhutan um, have a living and vibrant culture preserved with respect and reverence. I couldn't stress more that Bhutan's culture is a living culture and our traditional beliefs and customs stress respect for all sentient beings and encourage values such as tolerance, compassion, respect, and generosity. But obviously there is a delicate balance between the changes brought up upon by a rapidly modernizing and globalizing world and the traditional Bhutanese way of life. So that takes us to the fourth pillar, um, equitable and sustainable socioeconomic development. And this is really much, very much the core of Bhutan's development po policy, ensuring that all of its people, including the poorest and the most a remote villager, benefit from improved healthcare, education, and social services, and that the needs of the present and future generations are met through policies that are sustainable. But how do we ensure equality and encourage sustainability when so much of the world seems driven by consumerism and material gain? Possibly the best way to do is uh, to lead by example of our leaders. Um, on the day of our, our king's coronation, he told the Bhutanese people, throughout my reign, I will never rule you as a king. I will protect you as a parent, care for you as a brother, and serve you as a son. I shall give you everything and keep nothing. I shall live such a good life as a good human being that you may find it worthy to serve as an example for your children. I have no personal goals other than to fulfill your hopes and aspirations. I shall always serve you day and night and in spirit of kindness, justice, and equality. 
So therefore, Bhutan's development is really focused on sustainability and equity. Um, schools and healthcare will reach the most remote village and um, every child will have an opportunity to reach their full potential. So to this end, Bhutan um, allocates about 25% of their annual budget to the social sector, providing free education and universal health care. Yet problems do exist. Um, and while education reaches about 90% of the people, the quality of education uh, needs to be greatly improved. Um, so to address some of these problems, a number of development in initiatives have been um, uh, have been taking place to ensure that all children, and, and that includes children with special needs, have access to education. And, and that's been a program that the Bhutan Foundation has been working on as well. Um, and while healthcare is free, uh, Bhutan only has about one doctor per 3,000 people and one nurse per 725 people. And so therefore, we have extensive ongoing training programs to build capacity of doctors, nurses, and first responders. Um, those are the people that are first at, a, at, a, as a, at an incident site. Um, so at the Bhutan Foundation, we've actually been working um, in emergency medical response and training, and that's happening all across the country. Um, now every Bhutanese doctor in the country is getting trained in EMS, and we've trained over 5,000 first responders, anywhere from police to firemen to taxi drivers and even Bhutanese nuns in very remote villages. And lastly, I, I kind of want to uh, share uh, that Bhutan was incredibly lucky during this pandemic um, because the country um, as a whole responded collaboratively and has been quite successful in managing this pandemic. Um, you can see in this, in this picture on the top right corner, um, that's a picture of His Majesty the King and the Prime Minister um, and other government officials. They visited each and every citizen that was vulnerable um, and educated them on the risks of COVID and asking them to stay at home. So far, we've only had about 246 cases and uh, 175 of them um, are recovered. Uh, most of the cases were imported. Um, that means that those that were infected were Bhutanese that lived abroad and came, actually came back to Bhutan on, on repatriation flights after they lost their jobs abroad. And as you can see, you might be able to see, it's a small number down here, but um, uh, hundred, the, we did about already about 14,600 tests. Um, so we're doing mass testing in Bhutan as well. Um, but in particular, I just wanted to, for you all to see the image on the bottom right corner that really shows the fight against COVID is a united effort. Um, and this effort was led by the, His Majesty the King, our Queen, our Prime Minister, our Health Minister, and literally every citizen that has volunteered their time and supported um, all their efforts to fight the spread of this disease. So in this sense, Bhutan's approach really did work to protect the people of the country. So as you can see, Bhutan's approach to development is quite different. And I believe um, we've definitely shown how it could work. Uh, while it remains somewhat a subjective measure of progress, it does provide a vision for a more equitable and just world. One based on those core principles of Buddhism so enshrined in Bhutanese society, compassion and the fundamental values of kindness, equality, and humanity. And actually in 2011, the UN uh, unanimously adopted a happiness resolution put forth by the Bhutanese government. Um, and it invited all countries to pursue the elaboration of additional measures that better capture the importance of the pursuit of happiness and well-being in development with a view to guiding their public policies. Since then, there have been a number of countries that have adopted similar development policy, uh, philosophies similar to uh, gross national happiness, such as Costa Rica, Thailand, South Korea, Canada, and much more. There's actually been a handful of cities in the United States as well that have adopted some of these policies. So in conclusion, I don't wanna suggest that everything is perfect in Bhutan. Uh, we do have some real problems um, ranging from addressing environmental consequences of the rapid expansion of hydropower um, and to dealing with a young population of educated youth who are either unemployed or underemployed. 
There's also a lack of capacity and specialty in many areas of needs, such as healthcare, education, research, and much more. Um, which, which is why, which, which is why I started working at the Bhutan Foundation to address some of these gaps. Um, as the director of programs and external relations, I've been fortunate to be able to work with the royal government of Bhutan local CSOs, which are Bhutan's NGO sector, and local communities to solve issues either at the local level, um, all the way up to the policy level. And with that, I will um, end my presentation and take questions from um, all of you about Bhutan, gross national happiness, or even the work of the Bhutan Foundation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sharing. Um, for those of you who came in late, um, we're inviting everyone to put your questions into the chat. And uh, so if you would be willing to do that, and while you're putting your questions into the chat, um, Sharing, I might ask the first question. And I guess one of the things I wonder about, and you didn't mention in your presentation, is the role of religion and spirituality in Bhutan and how um, those particular values are um, employed um, in the process of gross national happiness and helping people to develop um, the sense of contentment that you talked about? Yeah, I think, um, so part of my, um, my presentation um, that I talked about was how Buddhism came to Bhutan and it really kind of um, established our cultural values um, that we have in the country. And those were, uh, those, those values are pretty much enshrined and in, in, in GNH. And that's where GNH, I, I believe, came about. Um, and um, actually it was, it was, the term was coined by our fourth king. Um, and, uh, and then ever since then, you know, um, we now have a, a uh, GNH um, center that really studies um, the various indicators and um, different domains of uh, gross national happiness besides the four pillars and talks about how each of them contributes to happiness and well-being of a person. And um, they actually do a, um, a, G a happiness survey every two years in Bhutan. Um, but, you know, at the core of it, I think most of uh, what G where GNH comes from is really from within our cultural values uh, that are enshrined in Buddhism, um, looking at compassion, um, looking at generosity, um, you know, all these different values are really what, um, what how GNH came about. I, I, that's what, at least I believe. Great. We have a question here from Morgan Deal, and the question is, what do you see as the biggest difference in values from Bhutan and the United States? And do you think these values significantly contribute to happiness? Um, you know, I think everybody uh, uh, in the US at least, um, um, actually I often like to, I, a lot of my friends say that I live two different lives. I live a, a life as a Bhutanese and I live life as an American. Um, and um, since I do travel to Bhutan um, about three times a year, uh, when I'm in Bhutan, I'm Bhutanese, and when I come to the U.S., I'm American. Um, but, you know, I think it's, it's an individual's pursuit, and the values that you enshrine in yourself. Since I did grow up in Bhutan, I'm Buddhist. Um, my cultural values and traditions are deeply rooted from Bhutan. Um, and I often try to use those values to live my life here in the U.S. as well. Um, but there is, there is a lot of difference because in the U.S., you know, most people are uh, independent. Um, uh, you have your own opinions, your own values. You kind of live your own life. Uh, whereas in Bhutan, we're more of an inclusive society. Um, you, we live as a community. We work as a community. Um, you know, if, if your neighbor has an issue with water, that's an issue for the entire village and the entire village helps bring water to you. So, um, so th there are differences and, and, and I think it also has to do with modernization as well. You know, um, definitely there are urban centers in Bhutan where um, it's very much like here in the US, people are very much independent and uh, do their own thing, live their own lives. But, um, but in general, the sense of community and family is, is and inclusivity is 
fairly uh, big in Bhutan, uh, which I think um, is quite unique. We have a question from Lydia Kane who says, I read that local-based agriculture has been a large advantage in Bhutan during COVID-19. What do you think Bhutan can offer in terms of educating on the localization of agriculture? Um, that's a great question because um, honestly, uh, Bhutan did, uh, during this pandemic, did learn a lot, um, basic, uh, mostly because we are so import driven, uh, an import driven country. Um, we were largely uh, an agricultural society, which to some extent we still are, but uh, we don't produce enough within our country to be sustainable. So um, food security actually was a major issue that um, the government had to deal with during this pandemic because we import most of our food from neighboring India um, or um, Thailand. Um, and because one, when the pandemic hit, all these borders shut down and that limited the number of uh, amount of food that was coming in. So the government really uh, made a big push for um, especially young people that are that were out of jobs to start um, farms in their villages because um, that's also been a big issue for Bhutan is uh, rural to urban migration. A lot of villages are left fallow and empty because um, the young people don't want to live in the villages anymore. They want to move to the bigger cities to find new jobs. And um, these big cities don't really have, big cities as in a big town um, in the, here in the U.S., but don't really have the jobs for them. So a lot of them have actually um, created uh, farms and um, there's a huge initiative where they're providing interest-free loans to those that want to start new businesses in farming uh, or in the agriculture sector. Um, we've actually been quite fortunate um, that we um, received a, quite a large grant from USAID that where we are working on um, food security issues um, and unemployment issues in Bhutan right now and supporting uh, local farms throughout the country to, um, to really meet the needs of the demand uh, that we have right now. We have another question from Caitlin Frazee. Do you think the inclusive community of Bhutan is why the country has handled the COVID-19 crisis so well, as well as your example of leaders going directly to people and educating them on how to stay safe? Yeah, um, I, you know, um, I'm sad to say this, but you know, the response here in the US has not been inclusive or collaborative. Um, and um, it was really heartening to see, um, you know, um, my home country to be able to do that. And I, I do understand, yes, Bhutan is a small country and um, we have a um, substantially smaller population to deal with. Um, but the united effort that everyone from the local villager in the most remote village all the way up to the to His Majesty the King, everyone was in was in it together. And um, and actually in that slideshow, I forgot to mention. I'll just pull it back up. Um, I, I mentioned in quotes underneath there. It says um, our Genku. Uh, Genku in 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 Bhutanese means our responsibility. And this was really the the slogan that was used during the entire pandemic. And, um, and it's been used in many other situations as well, but everyone takes their individual responsibility to, to battle against uh, this COVID-19. COVID and so we had, you know, local citizens, uh, volunteers that go and help um, deliver vegetables to people's homes. We had people uh, going and uh, giving, um, donating money to the government. So because the government had so much to deal with during this pandemic. Um, even the testing sites, you know, people are, are ready to lend their hand here and there to help those in need. Um, our, our king even started a, a relief fund where um, he was providing um, support to those who lost their jobs, who are from the most vulnerable um, populations in the country. And um, so it, it really was a very, 
collaborative, inclusive effort. And I think that's what made it a, a success story. Um, and um, and it, it would actually be a really great uh, research project for a uh, public health student. The other question coming from Caitlin is, what specific things do you do for the foundation when you're actually in Bhutan? Um, so, so because Bhutan Foundation, we are a really small nonprofit. We have five staff here in, in DC. Um, I wear a lot of hats. Um, so I, um, when I'm in Bhutan, typically I wear my program hat um, and I oversee a number of our projects. Um, uh, one of the projects that I oversee is our special education program where we um, provide build capacity of, of teachers, um, of care providers, um, as well as parents of children with special needs. Um, and um, when we, we started the program in 2006 and, and now we've uh, grown the program so much that uh, the government has put together a policy for individuals with disabilities. Which, so it's been quite a successful program in bringing to light the rights of individuals with disabilities um, and especially children with disabilities in the country. Um, and then I also uh, oversee our, our cultural programs and our health programs that we have working in emergency medicine and public health. We also have uh, a, I have, I also have a major project on uh, restoring this old palace um, we're trying to convert it into a museum um, in the country. So I wear a lot of hats. And then when I come back to DC, I'm usually wearing my fundraising hat. And um, I go out and uh, talk to donors uh, about some of the programs that we have in Bhutan and um, basically um, ask, ask them to fund a lot of our projects. Um, I also do a lot of proposal writing. Um, and, but it really helps to be able to go back to Bhutan and see the projects um, and how it directly impacts uh, the communities on the ground. So when you're able to see that, then uh, that also not only gives you self-satisfaction, but also uh, when, you, when I come back here to the US, I can report back to the donors directly about how big of an impact that, uh, that project made um, on the local population. So, um, so those are some, some of the things that I do. We have a question from Quinn Kempker that relates to politics. And the question is, part of the issue I see with the US COVID response is our highly polar political climate. Under Bhutan's democracy, is there any polarization? It seems like Bhutan is highly united. So I wonder about how the people deal with any of their political differences. Um, that's a great question. Um, actually, during this pandemic, um, that was, it was really incredible because um, we do have, uh, we have about five political parties and um, we have uh, in just two leading parties that go um, uh, into the National Assembly or the parliament. And um, we have the ruling party and the opposition party. And typically, you know, there, there are definitely, you know, politics involved where, you know, whenever the ruling party has an agenda, the opposition party usually tries to um, uh, talk against it. But during this pandemic, it was, it was incredible to see it was a united front, you know, the uh, ruling party was there with their prime minister and the health minister. And then, you know, the opposition leader was there in the front too. I was telling you about um, his majesty and, and um, the prime minister going on these visits. Um, even the opposition leader joined them on some of those visits. And, you know, it was, it was a united, united front. Um, and I couldn't emphasize that more. Um, it, was, it was quite incredible. And um, they were very supportive of each other. And, um, and yeah, it's, it was, it's been quite, um, quite interesting to watch. I have a question uh, sharing about the preservation of culture that you mentioned. Obviously, Bhutan is very close to China and India. Um, is do the people of Bhutan feel um, any pressure coming from those countries in terms of preservation of culture, of culture or any Western influences that Bhutan is trying to resist? 
Yeah, I, I think um, I think that's a big concern for the government. Um, you know, I, I'm actually wearing our national dress. Um, you know, um, our national dress, our language. Um, you know, some of the traditions, cultural traditions we have, are really at a risk of um, we're we're at a risk of losing them uh, if we don't preserve them right now. Um, so that's been a big priority for the government for a long time with influence from um, outside coming in. You know, we have now we have television, internet, you know, um, you know, people love K-pop in Bhutan now. And so there's all that concern about, um, but I think, you know, our, um, our deeply rooted traditions and values that we grow up with are, um, are basically our hope, and and the youth of Bhutan now have become quite uh, quite involved in you know really trying to promote um, whether it's uh, using Bhutanese textiles to create new um, you know modern types of uh, uses or you know um, but but overall I think we've done pretty well. Um, people wear our national dress with pride um, and. Uh, which which never didn't used to be the case a long time ago. I felt because it just felt like a nuisance to be having to wear this national dress versus where you could wear pants and a shirt quite easily. Um, but now there's a, this sense of um, pride and nationality that's been really incredible to see over the years. Um, and and of course we are really concerned with um, China to the north and India in the south. Um, we saw what happened to Tibet, Tibet in um, Tibet uh, up in um, at, that got taken over by China, and um, that's a big concern for us uh, for Bhutan. And we've had we have border talks with China um, every two years, and and there are certain areas that are of Bhut in Bhutan that are still under debate. Um, and 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 it's a it's a concern for us, and we don't have diplomatic relations with China yet, so. Um, however, um, India in the south is has been practically a big brother to Bhutan, and you know they provide a lot of support um, to us. Um, whether, you know, uh, but one of the you know one of the main things that they do support is our hydropower projects, and um, and so in return we do sell them our uh, electricity uh, for quite a l low rate and. Um, but I think um, all all these cultures between between these countries are sort of enshrined within Buddhism. That um, I think uh, it, it works pretty well for for us. Um, and um, and so, but but we'll see uh, what happens in the future. You know, um, one of the projects that we're working on is preserving music in in the country. And so we're going around and because a lot of the traditions in Bhutan are oral traditions. And so none of them have actually been recorded or written down. So we're working with the local NGO called the Music of Bhutan Research Center and they're going around every village recording uh, local dances and songs um, just to ensure that they don't disappear uh, so that there isn't future generations to pass them on to. So, um, so that's one initiative that we're working on another question from Quinn. Uh, he says, speaking on Indian and Chinese relations, are there any national security worries stemming from the tense relationship those powers share? If so, how are those security questions being dealt with? Um, yeah, it's a, it's a big concern. Um, I'm sure you guys are all, uh, I'm not sure if you see it in the news, there are major issues going on right now between um, India and China um, in a border on the on the eastern side of the country, um, and and it's it's a big concern for Bhutan. Even um, a few years ago, maybe about two years ago, one summer, you know, we had um, China had built a road all the way to a, a point in in uh, Bhutan, uh, Bhutan's border, and India came to our defense. Uh, but Bhutan is Bhutan tries to be um, what do you call it? Um, uh, doesn't like to be very open and out, uh, whereas, you know, the Indian media is very open and out and um, 
in talking against China. And so Bhutan has actually done a really incredible job uh, making things work diplomatically. So uh, they, they usually use diplomatic channels that we already have established to work on some of these issues. Uh, but, it, but it is, it's scary. It's, it's, it is a con big concern for Bhutan. Um, and we'll, we'll, we'll just have to see what happens. Um, we still have a lot of areas in our northern border that are still being debated uh, with China. And, um, but, but, you know, India has been a good friend to us and we, we know that they will have our back, I think. So, uh, so, so that's, that's something um, that we can rely on, but, but at the same time, um, we're, we're worried about what's gonna happen between India and China too, um, because they're having major issues right now. We have another question from Lydia Kane. She asks, how does Bhutan argue that such active conservation of the environment contributes to gross national happiness in contrast to nations who have taken more or less active stances on protecting the environment? Great question. Um, so, um, well, we've, we've done an incredible job in terms of, you know, preserving our environment and mainly because our leaders have really put in policy put in policies that, that are, are, are important for us and are, um, you know, has really helped the country become quite successful in environmental conservation. Um, we've done um, quite a lot in terms of um, going to international conferences to try to voice our opinion on the importance of environmental conservation. Um, and, and also how it contributes to GNH really is, um, is up to the individual, I think. Um, you know, creating, providing an environment that's that's um, that enables you to be successful and um, happy. And um, I think one thing that I, I, I like to say a lot is that um, true GNH, you can actually see uh, a lot of it in the villages in Bhutan, um, uh, not so much in the urban centers. Um, and uh, when you go to the village, that's where you don't have access to every single iPad or material things that you could possibly imagine. You know, it's in the villages where they live quite an easy but very content life. And they don't have, uh, you know, electricity all the time. They don't have access to water all the time. Um, so they make the best use out of what they have. And um, these communities are really where you see true happiness or contentment. Um, and I think that's where um, this, these environmental policies really come in place is that these villages stay the way they are and um, not big cities come in and big towns come in and get rebuilt over these cities. Does anyone else have any questions? Oh, here's one. Quinn Kemper again. Does Bhutan have a standing military? I know Buddhism is very pacifist in nature. Do you rely mostly on your close relationship with India? Yes, so we do have a really small military um, and um, it's not, not very big. And most of our military is trained by the Indian military. And we do have some Indian, Indian military presence in Bhutan as well. Um, and uh, most, of, uh, most of them are actually trained by these Indian military uh, people in Bhutan. But a very small, um, uh, you know, I don't, I think if we went to war, it wouldn't be uh, sufficient. <laughs> Any other questions for from members of the audience? Not seeing right. any more in the chat. Sharon, do you have any last words for us? Well, I just want to end with um, with this little slide. Um, it's actually from my graduation. Uh, this picture. Um, I really want to thank everybody uh, for joining joining us t today and uh, for Westminster for um, inviting me uh, to speak. Um, and uh, I just want to 
let all the students even know that you know some of my best friends are from Westminster. I think some of them are actually listening in on this webinar. Um, and I couldn't thank Westminster enough for all the experiences, all the education, everything that I've I've gotten so far. And um, and I, I'm I'm truly thankful. And uh, um, and so I just want to say uh, thank you to Westminster and thank you to um, all you guys for joining us today. And thank you, Dr. Jones, for moderating this session. Well, on behalf of Westminster, I want to thank you so much for this wonderful presentation. There were some comments in the chat earlier about what a wonderful presentation you gave, and I heartily concur with that. And thank you for all the great work that you're doing for the country of Bhutan. You're representing Westminster as a graduate so well, and we're so proud of you. Thank you so thank much. You. Thank you to our audience. Um, reminder to our audience, we have one more session coming up in the symposium, and I, I invite you to join. Thank you so much. Thank you.